Hello, I'm John Canty, editorial co-director of 84,000, translating the words of the Buddha. And today we'd like to introduce to you another of our texts in the series of Sutras for Well-Being. And this one is called The Aspiration Prayer from Destroyer of the Great Trichiliacosm. It's a set of verses that were recited by the Buddha as he stood at the city gates of Vaishali. He'd been invited there because there'd been a terrible epidemic and famine that had ravaged the city. And as soon as he arrived and recited these verses, the whole thing miraculously came to an end. This might sound familiar because a few months ago we presented another text on exactly this same theme, the same incident. This is a slightly different version because it comes to us through a different Vinaya tradition. But the theme is the same, the qualities of the three jewels. The difference between this text and the previous one is partly that um, in the previous one there are a lot of stanzas that are on the qualities of the Buddha. And in this text, the emphasis is more on the qualities of the Sangha, at least in terms of the number of stanzas. It's partic uh, particularly interesting, this text, because it corresponds almost exactly to a sutra in the Pali Canon called the Ratana Sutta, the Sutta on the Jewels. In the Pali tradition, that sutta is a very well known and very widely used indeed. It's recited on all kinds of occasions as a blessing, a protection, a consecration, and so forth. This text is probably less well known in the Tibetan tradition, but it exists as a standalone text in the Kanjuro. And it's very interesting to find it there. The first verse is on the Buddha, the qualities of the Buddha and it describes him as being incomparable, somebody who is completely unlike anything else in this world and well beyond even the very highest level of the gods. Then there are two verses on the Dharma, one on the Dharma of realization, the state that the Buddha's mind experiences, if you like, which is a state that's vast, deep, uncompounded and like ambrosia. And then the second verse on the Dharma is on the Dharma of practice or the Dharma of the path. And it mentions the Vajralike concentration, which is actually the last practice that Bodhisattvas apply on their path as they're breaking through to the final stage, which is almost Buddhahood itself. And then there are no less than six verses on the Sangha that describe the Sangha as the um, great field for uh, accumulating merit for those who respect and make offerings to it, but also as consisting of those who put the Dharma into practice and attain its results. And as they progress through the stages of the path, they become unshakable, they become incapable of all sorts of uh, wrongdoing, um, negative action, um, pride, and so forth. Um, they progress to different states of awakening that uh, are almost indescribable. So the Sangha, in a way, is us. It's whoever wants to put the path into practice. And whoever begins is almost bound to end up um, attaining the results at some point. There are then uh, three verses in which um, the uh, wish is that all beings may pay homage to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha and a few lines in which the Buddha challenges the negative forces, the spirits who may have been responsible for the epidemic, to change their ways and to become the protectors of beings and not um, those who are causing them uh, all of these troubles. Now, um, one might wonder what is going on here when the Buddha performs um, a miraculous transformation of the whole experience and environment for everybody. And first of all, remember that this is a Vinaya text. It's not a text that's coming from the Vajrayana, full of magic and um, uh, miraculous uh, events. It's not even from the Mahayana. And these accounts of what happens when the Buddha visits a city are, is actually a recurring theme in uh, the texts of all Buddhist traditions. 
A Buddha stands at the city gates. There's sometimes a small earthquake of a kind that's not destructive. Um, celestial music is heard. Um, the people who are sick are cured. The people who are blind are able to see. People who are deaf be become able to hear again. Um, people who are poor begin to prosper. And even the physical spaces in the city, those that are confined and narrow and low, become broad and high and expand. So there's this very profound transformation of everything, both the beings and the environment, that the Buddha brings about. Now normally you would think that the, the path consists of um, the Buddha or a teacher coming along and saying, um, you, whatever suffering you're going through is due to your uh, past actions and if you can um, begin to behave in a less negative way and begin to accumulate merit then gradually your experience will change or we might be told uh, you should be more aware um, especially more aware of the mind less a victim of its impulses or we might be told um, things like sickness and health are dualistic concepts that we need to uh, let go of. And all of these things, in a way, uh, are found in the text and they are parts of the path that, um, of course, have their own importance. But here the Buddha seems to be circumventing that whole process and coming along and saying, uh, without really saying anything actually, um, he just changes everything for everybody. So is this some kind of strange exceptional event or is it um, a central part of his teaching? I think really it is a, a part of the teaching. He is showing us really who he is and unless we could see what is a Tathagata, somebody who's completely beyond the whole world, then we might not fully grasp where the path is leading to and what is its ultimate goal. And so I do think that that is um, a very important reason for him um, uh, displaying these miraculous uh, abilities. Of course he did it, I'm sure, for the uh, benefit of the people who were present at the time and they, they, had, they were going through terrible suffering. But in all, he also did it um, for the benefit of uh, beings in general and beings of the future, even us who are now reading about these events in the texts to show us again what are the qualities of the three jewels and that's why the verses come back to this um, invocation of the qualities of the three jewels, who the Buddha is, what the Dharma is, what the Sangha is and in each case the final line saying by the truth uh, of, of these qualities may there be well-being. That is the the powerful truth, in fact the truth that's kind of truer than anything else, which is really um, shows us the way forward out of the whatever sufferings we might be going through at any one time. So uh, reciting these verses and recollecting, bringing to mind the qualities of the Three Jewels is an important practice in, in all the Buddhist traditions and there are plenty of um, passages in the texts which explain how bringing to mind a Tathagata, whether it's a Tathagata present in the world at the moment or a Tathagata in another world or a Tathagata in a future world, um, the results are very beneficial and very uh, meritorious and it creates a connection which helps to lead us along the path. It creates merit which helps to fuel our progress on the path. And so uh, these uh, kind of practices really are the way forward and the way that we can begin to really create well-being for ourselves and, and for the world. So reading these texts has been a great inspiration um, and brings courage and resilience and has, has done so over the centuries to those who have read them and used them as their practice. So it's a great pleasure to be able to make them available in English now for readers all over the world and we really hope that you'll enjoy reading them and reflecting on them and may there truly be well-being everywhere. Thank you.